this afternoon session. So I know that the lunch was a little bit short, so probably it's people arriving, but in order not to delay the whole program. So it's a pleasure to have Ludwig Matthew with us, and please go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for setting up this beautiful um, meeting, sort of in this beautiful location. First time for me here, and I'm blown away, sort of how pretty this is. And um, um, I would like to share with you um, some of our recent thoughts centered around uh, optimal control with regards to implementing quantum algorithms. Um, so here's a brief overview. Um, I want to uh, take it as, as a starting point. Our a study that was centered around sort of mitigating barren plateaus that occurs in this context, and um, then um, go on to this um, uh, this uh, algorithm that we that we are proposing to use, uh, which is um, this uh, pulse engineering via um, projection of response functions, Pepper as we call it, and uh, briefly mention here I'll be maybe a bit more detailed or so, and. Um, this year is our experimental collaboration with a group of Christoph Becker and Klaus Lengstock and their team, uh, where sort of we utilize these type of ideas in the context of implementing um, quantum gates in the context of Rydberg tweezer system. Uh, then I would like to share with you some thoughts about our um, method called ORCA, sort of exclusive or quantum algebra. And um, time permitting, which I probably won't have, or so I might uh, say a few words about um, this kind of quantum simulation of dynamical RG um, in the context of the dynamical BKT transition. This is done together with a team of Chris Foot, and, um, which is really a, a joy to work with them there. All right, so let's get started. Um, um, if this works, if it lets me do this. Ah, okay, this, I need to stand closer. Okay, so let's start out with this here as a, <coughs> as a starting point. This is done together with uh, uh, Lucas Breurs, who deserves a lot of credit for this nice work. Um, you can take sort of this, and I should also say, um, um, so um, uh, some of the slides that I've seen here so far are absolutely gorgeous. So, so kind of these are, some of these um, are still in the phase of development or so. Uh, they're not quite as pretty as what I've seen uh, this, this morning, for example. Um, that's partially, this is my excuse now, that's partially because um, the preprints on here, Pepper and Orca, they just came out today and yesterday, so I'm still sort of trying. But I was just too excited to share this with you guys. Uh, that's why kind of uh, some of the things might look a little bit um, sort of um, in a phase of uh, growth, let's say. Um, okay, so uh, this is what one might um, think of um, if, one, if you see a quantum circuit in, a, in this kind of paradigm of discrete quantum computing. You sort of um, set up your uh, quantum algorithm composed of individual quantum gates all the usual classics here, Hadamard and X gates and C0 gates and so on. And uh, this is a very important and conceptually important um, sort of way of uh, depicting this. Um, it is sort of conceptually transparent because you kind of break down this complicated unitary into these kind of components. And it is also an environment where you can make statements uh, more easily, let's say, about scaling. Because in, if you now imagine you write down a sequence of quantum circuits with increasing number of qubits, then you can at least kind of sort of make a sort of well-defined sequence of that and analyze sort of the asymptotic behavior, the complexity of this, con um, of this, uh, um, of, of this algebra. Um, so there are sort of, if you, if you take this too literal, though sort of you might end up sort of um, uh, with some challenges, like for example, you might have some idle time and sort of might be an experimentally not ideal realizations. And this slide is supposed to illustrate this. If you take this here, small two-qubit circuit, like it is shown here, you imagine you have a Hamiltonian composed of um, some uh, parts of the Hamiltonian that you can control, and you have some parameters that uh, your experimental friend uh, can implement in the lab. Then if you take this literally, you might sort of end up with a sequential um, realization like it is shown here. You make some, for example, some pi over two pulse here. You have some sort of interacting pulse here and another pi over two pulse or so. But this really doesn't make full usage of the platform that, might, uh, that you might be working with. You are in a larger space, and you might be able to implement something like this here naturally, where you just can just in parallel con um, run all of your control protocols, all of your control um, operators here sort of um, at the same time. And now you can ask the question, um, is, there like a, is there a better, more efficient implement, um, implementation of a desired uh, or transformation in this larger space? So that is this large kind of multi-parameter optimization problem that occurs in this context. 
Um, so we use some, <coughs> like many others, we use some um, optimization um, algorithm, which I only flash here. We'll go into more detail later on, sort of, to um, where we sort of expand a little bit on this idea. Um, you imagine you have your, quant your qubits here. You, in you initialize them, typically in a randomized fashion or so. You propagate this in time. You read them out. You have some type of loss function. For example, the fidelity uh, compared to the desired state that the system should have after this time propagation. And you take some do some sort of gradient descent type of approach. This all leads to some type of grape and grape-like sort of um, um, algorithms and so methodologies in this context. Okay, so um, I'm being a little bit vague what exactly we did here because I want to draw the attention to a specific point. Um, if we recall that our Hamiltonian might be of the following form here, you have a couple of um, uh, time-dependent functions here, these theta j's. They could be Rabi-like pulses, they could be magnetic fields, there could be all sorts of free parameters that you might have in your, in your platform. And now you want to make sort of a usable set, a finite usable set of parameters out of this in order to constrain this infinitely dimension, uh, dimensional space here. And um, so one typical setup might be you use this, this kind of stepwise parameterization. You break up the time interval that you give yourself into these kind of step functions. And then the, the prefactor of that step function, that is now one of your parameters. And this is how you might sort of uh, represent this kind of functional space by a finite number of parameters. Um, and this here also has something to do with kind of variational quantum algorithms where you have a bit of a sequential realization of operations in time. Um, what we tried out sort of and what we were intrigued by is um, what if you go to Fourier space? Now you have a temporally non-local uh, parameterization of these theta functions. They all overlap like it is shown here. And really sort of we're looking at this, at this larger space that you go away from this kind of stepwise parameterization towards these temporally non-local representations like it is shown here. Okay, so um, we gave then, with this in mind, sort of, we gave ourselves a computational task. This is, um, I think by now, sort of, um, I've seen variations of this in a number of papers or so, um, which is the following uh, point here. So if you write yourself down some quantum Ising model, like it is shown here, it has a transverse field, um, a magnetic field formally, of a Bx and a By term, so it has two components, and it has the Ising coupling between neighboring qubits. Um, then sort of these fields together here, these uh, control functions together, make up the space of thetas. Um, those are your, tr this contain your trainable parameters. And then you give yourself the task to um, find the minimal energy, the ground state energy of some random Hamiltonian here. So if you pick your Hamiltonian, you pick them out of this time interval, and now you want to minimize uh, this energy by taking this Hamiltonian, propagating them over a uh, time interval of time one, sort of, um, and think of this u theta zero as your estimate of the ground state of your system. So that is the computational task that we sort of gave ourselves there. And here, without sort of um, trying to map out uh, too much about scaling and so on, sort of, let's just see how these two ways of parameterizing uh, your theta functions, how they compare. So here, for example, we take four qubits, and in each case, we, saw, we show you here um, three realizations um, as a function of the learning iterations, like it is shown here. Uh, this is here for four qubits. This is for six qubits. This is the um, energy difference compared to the exact ground state energy. And sort of the first impression, so this is really just more like a practitioner's um, type of sort of impression that one has is you can see that in the stepwise optimization, you keep getting stuck in these local minima here. Whereas kind of in these temporally non-local, in this Fourier representation, you see sort of an improved behavior simply on this practical level here. So, um, so you, you find sort of just um, without sort of mapping this out in a quantitative way, you find this sort of improved convergence by using a Fourier parameterization of these type of, um, of, this, um, of the control fields, of the control uh, functions that you're using. You can also kind of uh, scale this um, as a number of the um, qubit number here. Um, so I should mention here sort of, um, if you look at the space of theta, you have to constrain something, right? Because if you 
Um, for example, if you allow sort of yourself a finite time interval, but allow yourself to, that the energy scales of your control fields, of your control functions, have an infinite um, amplitude, you can realize, kind of, and as long as you're universal, um, you can sort of realize any unitary arbitrarily close. So you need to, in some sense, uh, constrain the maximum of the, uh, of the allowed space of functions that you are including. Um, it is also kind of an experimentally sort of relevant constraint because you might have just a maximum of the Rabi frequency that you can implement. You might have a maximum magnetic field that you are using and so on and so on. So this leads then here to this theta max, which is the global maximum of all the control function combined. Um, and basically here the punchline is that like if you set this constraint uh, too small, then the system uh, doesn't really find good improvement or so. And um, here I should say, kind of here we are now looking for these barren plateaus. Um, and we're looking at the variance of one of the gradients of the, um, of the energy uh, with regards to uh, one of the control parameters. This you can also define in different ways. You could define the, the global variance if you like. Uh, here we focus on this one quantity. If you, are sort of, if you give yourself a, a too small of a global constraint on the control parameters, then you don't see sort of good convergence. So you want to be sort of around here, sort of where you allow yourself enough control of the system. And what people refer to as barren plateaus is that as you scale up the number of qubits here from two to eight, that you see here equally spaced uh, magnitudes, indicating an exponential suppression of the gradient of, the, of your energy, um, of your loss function, like of your, error, of your fidelity function, if you like, so of your loss function, right? And this seems to be reduced, in our opinion. So yes. Uh, well, you mean the, the, the number? The number. Not, not okay. So so basically, um, so you you um, so the steps to imagine is um, uh, so this here was one of the magnetic fields. Um, so, for example, if we go to this parameterization, you pick out one of these guys here, and now sort of you look at the second order <coughs> derivative of that, um, of the total energy of the final state with regards to this um, parameter. That is what this quantity implies. So? so Ah, okay. So, so you do the, you do an ensemble average over the initializations. Also, you do like so you know, so, like, or kind of you can equally sort of do like an ensemble average over sort of um, your update steps, your optimization steps. So, right. So, like so that, that's what the okay. So that's the variance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that's the distribution that you that you I should have said. Yeah. So and um, this um, behavior seems to be reduced um, for this Fourier um, for this Fourier. Um, uh, representation here, sort of, you still find a reduction, but it seems to be sub-exponential. Um, we are sort of, um, given the number of qubits, kind of, we are motivated and we are working on sort of improving this, uh, pushing this to larger numbers. So that's why at this point in time we, we consider it an indication, like, uh, or candidate for barren plateau mitigation. Um, but um, uh, so in the sense that up to this qubit number, we find that sort of the um, the, the reduction of the variance is sort of sub-exponential. That is like a slower reduction of the, of the emergence of your barren plateaus. You can kind of imagine why this is, is a problem, right? So if your, your error landscape, your loss landscape becomes very flat and the system doesn't know sort of how to optimize anymore because the gradient is sort of so strongly suppressed, especially for growing numbers of qubits where you would, where you would hope you get at least some type of um, hint from the system, like how to, uh, how to implement your algorithm. Your, um, your algorithm. Okay, so um, this is kind of where I want to leave, leave it for the moment um, uh, for the, about the barren plateaus. Um, sort of, we, we tried out this kind of alternative way of par parameterizing your sort of control functions, uh, specifically stepwise versus the Fourier parameterization, and there seems to be sort of a tendency to mitigate sort of the emergence of barren plateaus. Okay, so um, this is kind of the uh, playground on which we wanted to expand here. Um, so um, let's kind of um, remind ourselves a little bit of these uh, properties of optimal control in this context with the purpose of having a high fidelity of a um, given uh, quantum transformation. Um, so basically this is a typical setup here, right? You have your Hamiltonian. It contains maybe a part that is not controllable. 
and then it has here these control terms composed out of the control functions and the control operators. Uh, these operators be j here, and you have a certain number uh, given sort of the setup that you're considering. Uh, and then this control function, we break up into these control parameters, these prefactors, and these, and these mode functions that we con consider, such as in the previous case, the stepwise um, um, parameterization here, that's, so the mode functions there were these kind of steps, and um, all sort of the Fourier modes, the sign functions, um, would also be, um, so it would be an alternative to that, and, um, but it could really be any type of expansion to use here, okay? And then, um, this is kind of delayed here. Okay, so they can then, like a typical sort of optimization task is you choose some initial state at, some t at time t0, uh, then you do two things with it. You propagate it in time with your Hamiltonian, and then um, is, is one thing, so rho of ts, or you compare, you generate the target state by applying the target operation to your initial state, and then you take the fidelity um, of this, you see how well are you doing, how close to the desired state did you end up, and then you optimize this iteratively, right? So this is this entire playground, um, sort of where sort of grape and grape-like methods come in, and a typical setup for this is that you now sort of modify your thetas, your trainable parameter, this is the loss function, which in our case is uh, just the fidelity, uh, you, you shift them a little bit, run your time evolution again, and take this difference quotient here as an estimate for the gradient with regards to that uh, parameter. And um, then sort of you do this grape up update by shifting your thetas, your trainable parameters, uh, by this gradient times some learning rate, uh, uh, learning rate alpha, alpha grape in this case. So here sort of on this slide, you see already two hyper, uh, uh, hyperparameters. You have the magnitude of epsilon here, which we'll come back to in a moment, and you have this learning rate here, um, alpha in this case, right? Okay, so again, there's of course a number of flavors, like all of these, um, different, uh, these different algorithms, they differ in the details and the implementation uh, and all of that, right? But this is, I think, a fairly representative kind of um, uh, key step of this algorithm. Okay, I want to bring into this discussion now the notion of response function, like an all-time classic uh, in physics. You imagine you have some system, can be anything, can be atoms, solids, whatever you have, and you apply a probing term to it of this form here. You have a generalized force, f of t, and it couples to some, to some operator b in your system. And now you pick yourself an observable that you're interested in, in your system a, and you ask how much is this observable changed due to this probing term. So you pick the b, you pick the a, in principle, you have this time dependence f of t, and the statement of linear response theory is that you take this convolution of this external force here with the response function, with a linear susceptibility chi a b, depending on these times, t of t and t prime, which is essentially this commutator of the two operators a and b in the interaction picture. Okay, so this is this classic, like you all know all of these kind of um, here, conductivity, uh, polarizability, magnetic susceptibility squares, uh, physics is kind of full of this. So it's a very useful kind of concept as well. Okay, let's take this concept and apply it to this optimization test that we just looked at. Um, so the way to think about it is um, you, we have these uh, control operators, bj over here, and now we take one of these guys here and you, we apply this type of probe term to it. We have minus epsilon, Here's the a delta function at a random time tr, and this is this is how we now probe the this is now what we probe the system with. Um, so you have two random choices here that you make in the algorithm that we are using there. Uh, you pick randomly one of these n b um, operators, and you pick a random time on your time interval here. In other words, our generalized force here is of the form epsilon times delta of t minus t r. So then, sort of in our formula, um, we have this, uh, we propagate now this guy sort of up to the time tr, and the observable that we're looking at is the following. It's really the row star. It's kind of the, you take the initial state and you apply to it the target um, operator, the tar for example, the not gate or what have you, sort of, uh, that's our row star. This is now plays the role of the observable, which we then also have to propagate into the interaction picture. So um, here's like a bit of a longish formula. 
I wish I could say I'm sorry, but I really just want to <laughs> discuss this with you guys. Okay. All right, so, so um, like, but it, it'll be over soon, I say, don't worry. Okay, so, um, so if I take now this formula that I showed you there, um, let's just throw everything in there that we just set up. Um, we have here sort of some prefactor. The theta function doesn't matter anymore because like TR is always smaller than TF. And what we have here is here's our initial state because that's what we need to trace over. We propagate our um, probing operator forward in time to the random time. Then we propagate our observable um, to this time, sort of. And you can take this entire structure, use the magic of uh, taking traces and shifting around unitary operators, and you can formulate the whole thing slightly differently, which looks like so. You take the initial state, propagate it to the random time, take the commutator, propagate it all the way to the rest, project it on the target state. This object here, chi j, is equal to the um, gradient. It is, it's an exact expression for df um, over epsilon, like so. You can calculate this object in a single run. You don't need to have two runs, but have just a single run. And it's also a hyperparameter-free re um, representation of this gradient. So uh, these hyperparameters in, in a practical setting, I always, I always feel like they're kind of a pain, <laughs> because in principle, you have to scan over them and look for the optimal hyperparameter in order sort of, um, basically that's another optimization task. You're saving this here by having the exact gradient. The exact gradient also implies that you're always walking um, in your gradient ascent type method. You're always walking up the, the, uh, the, the mountain in the right direction and not with, an, not with an approximated gradient, right? So that's actually a, a, um, a limiting factor of um, doing grape the way I described it to you earlier. Okay, so. We have now this gradient, like we, we, we probe or we, we probe our system, we perturb our system with this operator bj at the time tr. What do we do with this? Um, you take this object here and we expand now this delta function in the mode functions of your uh, control operator. These are the mode functions f, j, k of t, and these are now the projection coefficients of those mode functions onto the delta function. Um, and this then, taken together, leads to this update step um, uh, that we propose to use. Is, um, you take these thetas and you uh, take the uh, response function at this time tr uh, times the projection of these mode functions times some learning rate alpha zero here. Okay, so this can be then sort of summarized into our pepper update, uh, which looks like it is shown here. Sort of, uh, I'm just summarizing this here um, um, uh, what I sort of described to you before. Here's our time interval. We are, um, and you proceed as follows. You pick your random initial state, you propagate it forward to the randomly chosen time tr, take the commutator and propagate it all the way to the final time, project it on the target state, take the fidelity of that, this gives you chi of j, and then multiply your chi of j times the projection of the mode functions onto this, onto this um, onto the delta function here, and this is how you update the corresponding parameters. Okay, so that's the algorithm um, that we proposed, and uh, we tried this out here in the, this kind of two-qubit example. So here we wrote down ourselves just two qubits. We have an hx, sigma x, hy, sigma y. So this here is some type of Rabi control for each of the qubits individually, and we have some type of Heisenberg coupling between these two qubits. We chose ourselves a sort of a target um, operation, which is just the C not gate. And here we work then again with our sine functions. So all these, um, all of these three functions here, uh, this uh, hx, the two hx, and the j here, are written in this kind of sine function expansion with a finite number of modes here. So the mode functions take this form, and this projection on um, onto the delta function take this form here. So this results in this context in this type of update here. The theta jk is then updated by this quantity here once we have determined the uh, response function for a given time step. So <clears throat> this is how this then compares. Um, so here we have our, our pepper um, um, uh, trajectories, and these are the grape trajectories. Here's the number of runs, and this is the log of the, um, of the infidel, um, so it's, a, it's a mean log of the infidelity of our realization like perfect fidelity would be minus infinity. Um, and here I should also say, um, so our, this pepper method here has this kind of um, uh, fast convergence. And this flaw here is determined by the numerical um, accuracy of your ODE solver. 
you can shift this around or so, pick like uh, um, some other, sort of like a lower fidelity, and this one-to-one uh, -one determines this lower flaw here. So indicating that there's nothing else like that you're doing wrong other than sort of the, um, in, like, um, than the inaccuracy of the ODE solver. For grade, sort of you see this, um, this kind of shift here. So we picked here, we, we sort of tried to, we challenged our method by doing everything in favor of grape here. We took, we took also this kind of multi-parameter um, update, um, like it is shown here. Um, and we are, we are showing here, a bit, it's a bit of a, it's more like a guide to the eye than a, a useful quantity, but we, took, we show here the mean log, uh, the, the, yeah, the mean log sort of of these trajectories, which actually favors low infidelity. If you do it the other way around, mean infidelity, then for example, this blue line would sort of all be all, all the way up here because you have here these, this large number of trajectories that get stuck in these bad minima here. And they're basically overall sort of the impression I want um, that we're getting is that essentially all blue curves lie essentially above all orange lies. So in a, in a given setup, if you just have the two methods set up um, and you run one and the other one, you always find like a, that an individual trajectory um, does a better performance for this kind of pepper update. Okay, so here just for the fun of it, this is what you find then for these optimal protocols for, uh, for, uh, for Pepper, and you can sort of uh, visualize then the motion of the qubits here on the, on the block sphere, and it does exactly this kind of C0 desired C0 gate. This is more like an illustration of, so, so listen guys, what did you find actually, right? So, okay. Um, okay, so this is our conclusions on this method. Um, so um, we, um, the ingredients that we have in our algorithm is that you um, choose this um, random time, random operator, one of the control operator, and you determine the response of the fidelity to that, to a per perturbation of that control operator. And um, then you update your thetas, your trainable parameters, by taking this response and, and sort of project it onto the mode function. This is this update step here. And we find that, that we have both an in improved convergence, you have a faster convergence, and also the final implementation here, this flaw, is below sort of what you find in a typical grape realization. Okay, so, and this appeared on the archive this morning, so I'm, I'm assuming most of you read this, but in case you haven't, you're, you're very welcome to, okay, okay. All right, so like, so if, if, uh, if any of you read this, I buy you a beer, so like, I'd be, I'd be sort of so grateful, like, all right. Okay, so this I'm just going to, uh, roughly click through here, sort of. Um, so we're working here with Klaus and Christoph and their teams on implementing sort of um, quantum gates and Ritzberg uh, systems. Here, sort of, you have the usual uh, playground of having these uh, sort of cool, sort of high energy states of, um, of, of atoms where you have this very high quantum numbers. They have this uh, massively enhanced von der Waals interaction, uh, n to the 11th, which is sort of an unreal sort of. Um, enhancement, I would, I, I think, sort of coming from other parts of, and um, then you put them in your tweezer array and you look for gate realizations in this context. There may be two notable limits or so that, um, um, that might be worth your consideration. If you take a fairly large distance and they're fairly slow um, and a very fairly low sort of Ritzberg state, then, you, then your gate realization is based on accumulating the dynamical phase, whereas if you take a, a close, uh, a distance between these tweezers and a, or so and a large kind of quantum number, then you end up have a gate realization in the so-called blockade regime. Um, so we, we um, sort of find in our optimization that these regimes are sort of very relevant for, for, um, uh, for, the, for the behavior of this. Okay, okay. Um, so we made a model. Here's our 3P0 state. We take two of these as our logical qubit. We have a, our Ritzberg state, which belongs to the 3S1 uh, manifold. We have a Raman two-photon process between the logical qubit states here, and we have a Rabi um, um, uh, pulse between the um, logical one state and the Ritzberg state. We take some of the dissipation into account. All of this is done here in an Ethereum uh, setup. Um, okay, I could have saved myself some time saying this. And here, these are, this is just more like an illustration. I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, for now, sort of. Um, um, you then can optimize in the space of these individual Raman uh, transitions here, Raman pulses, and in this global Rabi pulse, um, you can optimize this here with um, sort of realistic conditions that, that we learned from our friends. 
And um, then you find that you can realize kind of a nice uh, CNOT gate, for example, where you see here the learning process. Um, <coughs> and this phi here is again some sort of global constraint on the system uh, that, that you need to, need to meet in order to um, end up in a good regime here um, for your, your CNOT gate. Okay, and you can also maybe, last remark on this here, you can also check the robustness of this implementation. This is sort of a typical question you might get asked. Um, what about sort of spatial fluctuations or spatial um, sort of uh, that, you, that you don't quite put the tweezers at the location that you're looking at, but um, furthermore, you have sort of motional vibration of, the, um, of your atoms in your tweezers, and you can check the robustness of this prediction. And what survives in there is that you, both the blockade regime and this kind of recoupling dynamical phase regime uh, have both a good robustness uh, behavior, but there's an intermediate regime here where all the energy scales, the Rabi pulses and so on, they're all on the same scale as the interaction, and that's where you have low robustness. So that's a regime to be, to be avoid, um, that you should avoid in an experimental realization. Okay, so this was um, here my conclusion slide. So I kind of uh, ran through this a little bit. This was a bit of a speed run of this part here, um, just, to, um, just to give you an impression of sort of uh, utilizing these optimization ideas in a practical context. Okay, so um, this next topic here, um, so before saying anything, uh, this is really all um, um, Lucas Breur's credit. He deserves all the credit in the world for this. Um, um, so if he conceived the idea, developed the idea, I was happy to, and excited to help, sort of, but it's really um, all, all sort of his, to his credit. It's like, um, uh, you should watch out for this guy. This is really, um, uh, really um, very impressive, of course. Um, yeah, okay, so um, we call this exclusive all-based quantum algebra. We're shifting gears a little bit in case I haven't mentioned it, sort of, um, and we call this here ORCA. Um, so by the way, sort of, we, we picked up on this, on this sort of, trying to give like cutesy names or so, kind of we have now fully embraced this um, in uh, pre presenting our work, yeah. Okay, so um, let's try out the following little game here, sort of, um, um, which uh, is a little bit the starting point for establishing this method. Um, here, sort of, you take the Pauli matrices, like so, you add the identity to it, uh, so you have zero, one, two, three, and you write those numbers in a binary representation, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on, right? Okay, that's what we call Orca notation now, sort of. And now let's do, let's do a couple of products. For example, if you take sigma x times sigma y, it is now this product here based on our, uh, based on our notation. You get um, i sigma z out of it, which is now i sigma 1, 1. You can also take this product, for example, and you get, um, it means that the product of these two guys becomes uh, this matrix here, zero, one, out of this here. Or you can also here throw in a, a trivial one where you just multiply sigma zero, one by sigma zero, zero, and you get, of course, the same matrix back. The interesting thing about this, in our opinion, is the, is the operation on these indices here. Let's check out these indices here, and let's kind of see what happens if we look at them digit by digit, okay? So what happens there is, um, for example, here, the first digit is a zero, second one is a one, and you get a one, all right? This is this guy here, right? Or here, sort of, the second one is a one, the, f the, the, first, the second of the first operator is a, is a one, and the second one here is a zero, gives you a one, right? So this is this line here, right? If you have two ones here that are collided, you get a zero. If you have two zeros here, you, you also get a zero. In other words, the indices in this binary representation follow an exclusive or sort of logical table, right? Um, so this is the starting point uh, for this um, methodology. Um, so, um, which is basically kind of cute, like, so like, um, I'm not sure this has been a, okay, so um, 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 then sort of there's a second part of this here. Um, we have to take care of these prefactors here, right? We have this i or minus i or one or so, and we write this in the following way. Um, so first of all, here we wrote our SQ2 um, algebra. Um, if you now have a general um, product of these four operators here, um, you get sort of here sigma j x or k, right? Sort of in the sense of having your binary numbers and you're operating on the x or digit by digit. Um, and you have the structure factor, as we call it here, as a, as a prefactor, which we write as i to the something, as a product type of form. And this bjk, sort of, you can make a, a lookup table, like it is shown here, uh, that sort of gives you the right prefactor over here. 
Okay, so um, um, okay, so so this here um, I should mention maybe sort of um, uh, these are all very computer friendly operations, right? Taking a XOR operation, <laughs> digit by digit on binary numbers, perfect, right? Um, also, this lookup table, you won't need anything more than a 4x4 four four lookup table, even if you scale this up to large tensor products and so on. Um, so these are all sort of very computer-friendly operations. So for example, you can extend this to tensor products of, of um, uh, these matrix, of these Pauli matrices. For example, here is now a four product, like four pro, um, of uh, four um, uh, sigma matrices. Here's another one. What you now do is you write down a multi-index. You write down the, our, our ORCA uh, notation and you, make a, you concatenate them. You just write them one after the other, giving you the multi-index um, pointing towards this tensor product of sigma um, matrices. Similarly, here's another one. This would be this multi-index here. Now you take the XOR sort of line by line, so it does here digit by digit, like it is shown here, giving you I XOR J. This gives you here the right sequence of um, um, tensor product of sigma matrices. And then you have to look up sort of your uh, structure factor, this exponent B here, sort of um, um, in, in pairs of two. And um, this here then you put here as the exponent in your I to the power, uh, in this case, to the power of two. So this is then how it scales up in a sort of basically ideal way, sort of, you know. <coughs> sort of, um, you basically, um, you're simplified, instead of taking uh, products of matrices, of very large matrices, all you do is like some index algebra, right? It's essentially um, sort of, it's, it's essentially an ideal speed up in this context. It's a little bit reminiscent of doing pointer algebra in a, in a, in a computer program, right? Okay, and the plan is to use this structure now to have a sort of good sort of uh, simulation tool of quantum dynamics, in, in this case here, um, um, on systems that can be thought of being uh, composite two-level systems. So here's a little bit our generalized structure, sort of maybe in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of keep this short. Um, but sort of what we want to do is we now write both our density matrix here in this kind of space of tensor products of, um, of sigma matrices, like it is shown here. So now we have broken this up into these row i's. These are now um, uh, sort of the coefficients, the real value coefficients of these tensor products here. And similarly here, the Hamiltonian, we also write this in this way, right? Okay. Um, and sort of we looked at a couple of different equations of motion, like sort of to, to describe different types of dynamics. For example, you can have von Neumann and Marston equation, or you can also look at the imaginary time evolution here, um, which is then you can translate this here line by line in this formalism that I described to you in this notation. There. Okay, so to um, describe to you, this is really the delay is growing, I think. Okay. So this is then the algebraic structure. This is the algorithmic structure of the algorithm that we're using there. Um, you have a dynamical list. Your density matrix here, first is here the super index. This is now written as here as a decimal number, but you should think of this here as uh, being a set of um, binary numbers, like I described to you. These are the indices, and these are the corresponding real valued numbers here. And it's dynamical, sort of the size of this list here will change in time in general. This here is the size of the list. Similarly, here's your Hamiltonian, which we also break up in, this, in the same way. Here's the multi-index for this component, and here are the real value components of your Hamiltonian, given with a size h like it is shown here. And this here now you can use to generate sort of the update step uh, of your time integration. You take the XOR for these multi-indices, you, you look up your structure factor, and this then generates the, um, the time evolution, the time step of your time evolution. So first calculate this, then you want to, then you can update your, your row according to this. In the example that I'm going to show, we use some row we put a, a fourth order or so. And then kind of um, in order to keep the system um, feasible, you have the option, you don't have to, but you can sort of truncate your sort of expansion or your representation by throwing out all of the, um, all of the components that you found there that are below a certain threshold epsilon or so. That keeps the system, that keeps the description <coughs> Uh, sparse in your in there. Okay, so um, we applied this here for quantum annealing, uh, to quantum annealing for the maximum in independent set problem. You can see we are a little bit influenced by sort of um, uh, working with Ritberg's or so, where this is sort of discussed as a possible application. Um, so the, in a nutshell, basically what you imagine 
you write yourself down some, uh, some graph here and you want to, um, you imagine you put like a unit circle around each of these sites here and you don't want two red um, errors in the same unit cycle. That's a unit circle. That's, that's not allowed. And then the question or the, the maximum independent set problem is to find a setup or all setups um, in which you have a maximum numbers of red um, uh, vectors here. Okay, and we apply sort of both versions to the, this, both the real time and the imaginary time um, evolution. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, imaginary time version of this here. Um, so this is, I'm gonna skip this here, and you find there's so, some good sort of um, performance in identifying um, the maximally <coughs> independent sets here, both for the imaginary time and the real time, um, uh, like it is shown here. Okay, so um, maybe sort of, um, um, just to comment on this briefly here, um, um, what we find for our algorithm here is the uh, CPU time. This is actually just done on a, on a laptop, even though you have up to 22 qubits or so. Um, here you see the effective size of your computational task, size of your density matrix list, and size of your Hamiltonian list that is shown over here. These are then different runs or so, and you see an approximately linear scaling or so. Um, so we are trying to learn about hash maps and in, in, in in what exactly is realized in a, in a MacBook or so, um, uh, because that appears to be the remaining constraint or the, uh, what, which might actually lead to a small logarithmic uh, dependence on top of this. Okay, so um, in conclusion on this here, um, I showed you this um, idea of um, ORCA, sort of where you in introduce this ORCA notation and you find this kind of efficient way of taking products of, um, um, uh, um, products of tensor products of um, Pauli matrices, um, reducing it essentially to taking the exclusive OR on the index, so replacing a mul um, matrix multiplication with an index operation, um, and uh, so with this then add to this um, also this, uh, uh, the structure factor term. Um, basically here write the spin algebra as an index and prefactor algebra. Um, then you can take this um, setup and um, use it to, uh, for the sim simulation of quantum dynamics like I described to you here and we used um, the maximally independent set problem as an example. Okay, so again, I'm out of time so I'm just gonna skip through um, this uh, stuff here kind of even though it's dear to my heart or so, um, but uh, yeah, we can talk offline if, you're, if you um, would uh, like to. Uh, chat about this here. I'd be I'd be very excited to do that. Um, and um, let me just go here to our conclusion page. So uh, in conclusion, here these first three topics here are centered around sort of optimal control and optimal implementation of quantum um, quantum gates and quantum algorithms in uh, in quantum systems. So it has this optimization path associated with this. And I would like to emphasize this kind of uh, new sort of uh, algorithm that we put forth which is our, our Pepper method here. Um, then this here is um, our sort of approach to uh, qu simulating quantum dynamics on a, at, uh, on a classical computer, which sadly is all we have these days, which we call the Orca method. I didn't get to talk about the dynamical BKT transition. Um, here, let me throw up the, um, uh, the reference to, to this here, and let me thank you so much for your attention. Uh, oh. <laughs> I can live and with I that. Don't but do anything, so. <laughs> really, what are you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I wonder whether any work has been done to look at whether an XOR representation or something like it would work beyond just SU2, looking at mm. d dimensional quantum systems mm. or, say, fermionic ones, for example. Mm. Awesome, awesome. Yes, uh, so we've, um, we've had a similar thought or so, like, and I, we can chat more about this or so. It's, um, yeah, so um, there are um, extensions of this here um, to um, other types of operators. Um, um, we, like, so we have something in the pipeline sort of where you do a bosonic thing, where you have a harmonic oscillator, uh, where, you have a, where you can find a similar index algebra. Um, we, we are playing with the fermions or so, kind of. Um, we can chat about this and get you involved or so. It's like, and um, um, sort of, um, yes, like, so it's a very natural and very good question. So, like, to 
how, how to expand this towards other degrees of freedom or so. And um, yeah, I think there, I think something should, should be possible. Let's put it like this. You're like, um, but um, yeah, you see, yeah. appreciate the question. Yeah. yeah, I should really emphasize this here, kind of especially on these methods or so. Um, if, there's, if, if you find any of this here mildly amusing or so, um, sort of um, send me an email, chat me up or so, and we get you involved or so. I'd be excited uh, to be um, here. You can, you can add some pepper to your life or write an orca, so you know, all, it's all there for you. All right. So please. Enough of the silly remarks. Yeah. Yeah. didn't hear the one word sort of I okay yes yes better uh, when you uh, intro when you expand the controls in Fourier space uh, do you introduce Yakatov on the number of Fourier modes which are involved in the expansion right Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you check whether this mitigation effect depends on the number of Fourier modes you, you keep? There, there is, um, so more modes give you better implementation. So um, it's, um, it's uh, essentially, if you look at the comparison that I showed you there, so like, so like uh, you, you're roughly sort of um, re shifting both of the curves, both for the stepwise and the Fourier in a similar way, at least by eyesight, like maybe we could, um, uh, scan this a little bit in more detail. So um, you have sort of, I think you have end up with the usual optimization thing that um, you might have more challenges in the convergence that might be a bit slowed down because it has to scan a larger space. You might end up with a lower floor because you, are, you give yourself the opportunity to have a better implementation or so. so as, as, as a qualitative level, it's a great question. So kind of, um, we have some plot in the appendix on this, I think, but it's, um, it's uh, um, we can chat about more on this, as I said. But, but as a tendency, that's the global tendency that we, that we see. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Is there any more questions? Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. So I wanted to ask about the ORCA. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so, so there are sort of two ideas here, and I'm not sure if they're both crucial for the same thing, but what, one is this sort of uh, basing things on poly strings and how they couple. And it seems like I could do that whether or not I wrote, use this XOR stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, this seems to be what would give you the real sort of scaling advantage that you might be seeing. And then it looks like the XOR stuff is just to make it really fast on a computer. Is that right or is there some more fundamental thing there that I'm missing? I, I, think, that's, I think that's fair, sort of. Um, and uh, I can live with this description. Making something fast on a computer is not a not a it's not a dirty thing, right? So no, it's great. It's great. I just <laughs> making sure conceptually, I understand. Yeah. Got it, got it. Uh -huh. It's like um, I think it's this this ease of usage of identifying. Um, I think what I think you're hundred percent right that you could in a similar way sort of take the x and the y and make a lookup table table to get the z. But sort of this is so such an easy sort of implementation. You know, that's like let's just go for that. You know, so like it's. Um, Perfect. And then I didn't really understand why you were getting linear in time scaling. I naively would not have expected that. Um, right. So I should. Um, um, so basically, um, um, to maybe to um, uh, reintroduce the notation. So, so this is the length of the of the list of the density component, density matrix components. This is the length of the Hamiltonian. And basically, what's on the x-axis there. Um, um, that is this set is the product of these two guys, kind of. Um, so that's that can be a large number, and also kind of, um, um, especially for example, if you, for example, sparse problems are essentially ideal for this. Um, 
basically, you're, you're also, um, we are also not beating quantum supremacy or so. Um, if your row is, is not sparse, and this is scale like two to the n, for example, you know that, that okay. I, I, I can, you. I see some nodding, so life is good, yes. <laughs> Appreciate the question, I think. Okay, I think we should stop here, and thank you very much, Ludwig, again for your talk. And